Father, thank you for the amazing provision you've made for the human race. And I'm praying now, Lord, that you would bless us as we reflect on how to be strong in the Lord. Guide us to that end, establish the work of our hands, bless the parents, the teachers, bless the Sabbath school leaders and the youth group leaders. May we raise up a generation that can say, I'm not embarrassed of Jesus and I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is my prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Last Sunday on Meet the Press, Kristen Welker interviewed a number of important people. She started out by saying to both the governor of Colorado and the governor of Utah, it's great to have you both here. Let's start by talking about the youth mental crisis. The Surgeon General, as you know, has called it the defining public health issue of our time. Governor Cox, I want to start with you. Do you agree with the Surgeon General? Look, we want to be data-driven in all this, so we've been working with experts across the country, the smartest people, and we've looked at all the data and all the research, and we've concluded again I think it's obvious to anyone who spends time on social media or has kids, I have four, I've seen what's happened to them as they spend time on social media and their friends, and this is absolutely causing these terrible increases. These hockey stick-like increases that we're seeing in anxiety, depression, self-harm amongst our youth. By the way, it's bad for our adults too, but especially bad for our young people. And so, look. If you saw a 63% increase in cancer amongst young women, we would be moving heaven and earth to do anything possible to change that. And yet, we've just kind of sat on our hands and said, well, I guess this is the new normal. Governor Cox, she asked, is there anything to be gained from social media? For example, could kids find a sense of community there? Could they find a sense of identity there? Do you see any upside to it? Sure. Yes, there's definitely an upside to social media when it's used properly and in the correct ways. But that's not how these apps are designed. And that's the problem. They're designed to addict our kids very intentionally, and these addictive features make it impossible for our kids to get the upside that benefits out of that without all of the downside. That's the last day of the last year by one of the major news media outlets. And then she also interviewed a Victoria Garrick Brown who's founded what she calls the Hidden Opponent. This is a young athlete. Here's what she said. I felt like I had checked all the boxes, all the ones I was supposed to check, going to a prestigious college, getting these grades, having a starting spot. We want a Pac-12 championship, everything on paper and on my social media looked picture perfect, yet I was the lowest I had ever been mentally. And I wasn't prepared to experience those emotions because the conversation around mental health was so stigmatized that I viewed it as a weakness. And for someone who wanted to be an overachiever, wanted to succeed, you know, in societal terms, associating with weakness or feeling like maybe I would fail in some way if I admitted I was struggling, I didn't want to do that. That prevented me from seeking help. Eventually, I got to this point where I felt I had nowhere else to turn. I'm grateful I confided in one teammate. That gave me the confidence to then see a counselor for the first time. And from there, I began learning about insane pressure that all students are under. That it wasn't just me, that this shameful outlier has this shameful outlier who should feel embarrassed, but really, this was a major crisis. That's really what led me to the advocacy work I do now. And you were a Division I athlete in college. Now, is it possible that the way we present ourselves online could actually be creating stress and structures that make real living seem weak and wrong and bad? Is it possible we've gotten ourselves into such a situation to where the presentable me. I'm my own best publisher. I'm I'm my own best 
advocate, is it possible that we've actually created a society where real people look like misfits? But the ones who don't look so real are really falling apart on the inside. I'm not going to talk to you about a mental health crisis today, although we do have one. I'm going to talk with you about how to be strong in the Lord. If somebody listening to me here today is in a position where they need that one person, talk to them. If there's one thing I want you to take away from this message, it's that good mental health doesn't keep you from going through mental health challenges. It allows you to get through mental health challenges. If there's one thing I want you to know is that the holiness of this book is its description of the weak spots and the challenges of those who not only wrote it, but were major actors in it. There are five people in the Bible we know of for sure who had a death wish. Do you want to start gathering your names? I'm going to help you. Five people we know of distinctly in the Bible asked to die. Let's start with the first one. Job said, why did I not perish at birth and die as I came from the womb? My sense is Job was struggling with a great disorientation. He couldn't, he didn't have any way to put meaning into his current circumstances. And yet God knew he was strong enough to handle it. His wife, on the other hand, well, Elijah, I've had enough, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors, 1 Kings 19.4. But let's go back in history a little bit more. Moses, Numbers 11, 11 to 15. Why have you laid this burden on me? It'd be better for me to die. Jeremiah, chapter 20, verse 14. Cursed be the day that I was born, the day my mother bore me. Let it not be blessed. And Jonah, chapter 4, verse 8. It would be better for me to die than to live. Now, as far as I can check the boxes, most of these were pretty astounding people in most of their life. And I could add more to the list, whether you were to define it as a mental health crisis or just as a terrible bout of depression. What I want everybody to understand here today is that God intends to give you the strength to go through the normal things that normal people go through. But if you find yourself a little farther in on the despair list, it's not a sign of weakness, it's just a function of humanity. Ellen White, in her late 50s, went through what I would call a serious bout of depression, whether we would define it as a mental health crisis or not. Fortunately, her son prompted her to get out and about and go back to doing some of the things that she needed to do. According to Mind.org in the UK, what is a mental health crisis? A mental health crisis is when you feel like you're at a breaking point. You need urgent help. You might be feeling extremely anxious, having panic attacks or flashbacks, feeling suicidal or self-harming. If anybody listening to me here today, I have a message for you. God loves you. You're loved by many people, even though they may not know the depths of your despair. And God is inviting you, prompting you, come to him and come to somebody that you know walks with him. Now, I'm not going to spend the subject matter of my time dealing with mental health crisis. I'm going to spend it dealing with how to become strong. And again, I want to say, if there's one thing I want you to take away from this message, is how to get stronger. But that's not a journey of independence. And in this American mindset that we have, where you can show no weakness, and in the what I'll call the 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 very disadvantaged arena of being able to only put your best face forward on the internet. I need you to know something. There's a lot of people listening here today or online. Some of them are aged. They've lost their hair. It's gray. They're stooped. They can't run like they used to. Their thinking's not as quick as it used to be, but they know something about life. And many of them love God, and they will love and listen to you. And you'll be surprised when you find out that you're not the only one or the first one. I can remember once sitting in the office of a uh, high-up administrator for our church, and I was talking with one of the administrative assistants. 
And I think the person was concerned they were losing their mind. (laughs) And it just happened to be that they trusted me, so they were talking with me about it. I'm quite confident that as soon as I said to them, I've experienced all those things too, that a huge burden rolled off their shoulders. It's like, oh. So if you're in the valley of despair right now, hang on. God loves you. Other people love you. Reach out to one of them. If you'd like to get out, not only do that, but consider some of the things we talk about here today because I'm confident That Jesus, who has a hold of you better than you have a hold of him, is going to get you all the way through. My favorite Bible verse in all of the scriptures is Philippians 3.12. Let us take hold of that for which Jesus Christ has taken hold of us. And as a former lifeguard, I can tell you, the person you're saving, you don't even want them grabbing on to you. But the lifeguard knows how to hang on to the person they're rescuing. So this morning, be of good courage. I want to talk with you about how to get stronger or be strong. Now, I'm holding in my hands a few surveys here. This one from Arizona Christian University. 43% of millennials don't know, don't care, don't believe God exists. That's easy for you to do when you're a millennial. It's easier when you're young. You're smart. You don't ever think you're going to get sick. You don't think you're going to die. You got the world by the tail. You know more about technology than all the people who came before you, maybe all rolled up into one. But life just happens to roll on. And people do get sick and die, and marriages break up, and life goes south, and you have to face all the other gravitational pulls of being mortal. Let's say we are spiritual beings. Let's say that evolution is false. Let's say that every social, relational, and mental theory built built on the absence of God is actually bunk. Would we expect, as the CDC says, that a youth mental crisis would become the defining health issue of our day? Maybe starting out with 43% not believing, not knowing, or even worse, not caring. If ever this was a day for parents to make sure their children are on the acute pain list instead of the lifelong chronic pain list, this is the day. So they tell you they don't like you. Okay. Are there nobody that could say amen? (laughs) Okay. So you don't like me. Dads be dads. Encourage mothers. How tech hijacks our brains, corrupts our cultures, and what to do now. National Public Radio. Again, National Public Radio. What is the cost of infinite distraction? Tristan Harris, former employee of these big tech companies. And how about this one, Time Magazine? There's worrying new research about kids' screen time and their mental health. Duh, this is old news. This is two years old. Now, I want to ask you a question, and I want you to think about the answer. How many people were alive when Noah got on the ark? Get your number. Millions? Billions? What if it was only hundreds of thousands? The question I want to ask yourself is this. Why did only eight people walk on the boat? I want you to think about it. Do you really think that all those wood hewers and those people driving those pins into the boat, do you really think that all those people spreading tar on the side, do you really think that the hundreds and maybe thousands who actually worked on the boat didn't know the genuine integrity of Noah and his sons and weren't under a divine impression from the Holy Spirit to take advantage of the ark, the floating ark they just built? So why didn't they? Here's why. Somewhere along the line, they missed the initial elementary steps about how to be their own person because you see, this is what mental health, spiritual and relational health is designed to do. And somewhere along the line, They quit being their own person and pretty soon they were identified with the group and they were afraid of losing the affirmation of the group. You know there were hundreds and thousands who were impressed. Get on that boat. 
And if you don't think the same thing's happening as we come down to the end right now, you need to think again. And if there's ever been a reason to have good mental health, it's now. And I want to assure you that good mental health is tied to good spiritual health, and its root is a friendship with God who can give you the confidence to know who you are so you can be who he's called you to be. This is where we're at this morning. When I was looking at the list of people who had long or challenged mental health issues, we could add people to it. Judas and Ahithophel, they both took their own lives. Ahithophel was a relative of Bathsheba and become the counselor for Absalom, who had tried to throw overthrow his father's kingdom. Took his own life. Judas did the same thing. I can imagine that for somebody like Jacob who fled in fear and now he's coming back in fear and there's 400 men coming to wipe him out that he's going through a little mental health crisis of his own saying, look what I did, look what I did, what am I going to do? That night by the river Jabbok when God lays his hand on his shoulder he thinks it's foe, not friend. So I was going over the list with my wife last night. She said, there doesn't appear to be any women on that list. But after we reflected on a few minutes, we came up with one. Her name is Naomi. She said, don't call me Naomi anymore when she was going home. Just call me Mara. And I had a new thought thinking about this message today. Is it possible that the best therapist, whether they're Jewish or Christian or not, is the one that loves you the most and won't let you go? Think about Ruth. I'm not leaving you, not until I die. I look at the story, turns around for everybody. I'm here to tell you, love as a therapeutic will always remain now and forever as the very best essence and instrumentality and lifeline of hope to anybody, anywhere. And this is why as Christians, the devil is very afraid that our churches will not become these fountains of hope, but they will remain toxic drains where our pride and our insecurities, when we can't get our way as we put up our tinsely fake selves online, have to give way to the reality of living with each other. Yes, indeed. We're living in a very unique age. So what are we going to do about it? Well, this morning I have a few suggestions. I'm going to suggest to you this morning, right from the very beginning, that man is a very spiritual being, mankind. And that true mental health is completely tied to a knowledge of the one in whose image you have been made. And I'm going to show you some very simple things. And by God's grace, there'll be something that's applicable to your experience. Now, before I go into the biblical recitation here, I want you to know something. Everybody has a different starting place. You look at your family of origin and your generational history, everybody has a different starting place. Some come to life with a completely larger capacity than others. And I think about John Mark, who went on that trip with Paul. And you know, Paul not only walked very close with God, but he must have come out of a pretty strong home because he got beat up. He was in fear of being robbed. He was cold. He was hungry. He was whipped. He was stoned. He was on the high seas for 14 days. Is it any wonder when John Mark on his first trip says, oh, this is too hard. I've got to go home. That... Paul says, that's it. You're not going with us ever again. It's also imperative that parents understand, teachers and preachers, that part of our job, beyond just the words of affirmation, the nurture and the encouragement, which are absolutely the bedrock of mental health, there is the balancing side, what Ellen White calls the sterner virtues, where you say, yeah, you are going to have to do that. In other words, there's the nurturing side of the family. It should come from both sides. And then there's the coaching side of the family that says, you can do a whole lot better, and you will. Pastoral ministry has become very difficult, along with the teaching ministry and, of course, the parenting ministry, which, by the way, the parenting ministry is the first pastoring teaching ministry. 
But for pastors, it's become very difficult to take an age in societal, psychological, relational, spiritual regression and say, we're applying the brakes. This congregation does not need to live like this, be like this, act like this. We're going to change. We're going to grow. This is how we're going to do it. Right here, this book. We're going to link ourselves to Jesus Christ, the great transformer of mind, heart, soul, and and body, and we are going to become something that only he could make us, but we are going to need to cooperate, and we are going to need some good leaders, and this and these are the principles and the precepts we're going to use. Yes, I want to say glory, hallelujah, to the Lord Jesus Christ for what he's done in this congregation, and I wouldn't want to suggest that there haven't been a few tough spots and a few very hard moments, but the reason a lot of churches are plummeting is that there is not a commitment to love like we need to love and do what is right with some discretion. And consequently, we embrace chronic pain over the acute pain of somebody saying, hey, you're sick. Would you like to get better? You called me sick? What's your problem, preacher? Yes, this is the high price of pastoral ministry and teaching ministry and parenting ministry. But I'm here to tell you today, if there's enough love and dependence upon God, if he can be the leader and we can be the follower, if he can be the main operator and we can be the cooperator, things can get better. And they have and they will. And I want to tell you, once you go from dysfunction to function, it's a much more beautiful ride. But your experience... Your family history, these things all shape you. And if you can be honest about how they shape you in the positive, you can overcome the negative. The Kelly family has and had certain strengths. There are some of you that bring certain deficits to this discussion abuse, physical, verbal, sexual. These are big deficits, they are overcomable. I want to suggest to you also that rebellion is one of the major regressionary dynamics. So for all of you kids who come out of home so good you don't know what bad is, be careful you don't fight the people that have laid down their lives to put up all these beautiful walls of protection so that you could think that their rule about what you do and don't do on Sabbath is <laughs> the worst thing that ever happened to you. We're not going to watch TV. No, you're not playing sports today. Or no, you're not going to wear that. Or no, we're not going to watch that. Your lives are so good, you don't know what bad is, and you think your parents are the biggest inhibitors to your happiness. Be careful, because there's nothing like rebellion to drag your mental, emotional, relational capacities into the sewer. Poor mental health is something that develops. It's not static. It has something to do with your family of origin. It has something to do with your church of origin. It's important for us to understand. And for all those preachers that are listening, you need to know something. The people you lead to Christ and the discipleship you give before you take them into that watery grave we call the baptism, your imprimatur is on them. Are they strong or are they weak? Are they nominal or are they zealous? Do they have a capacity to love God and love a lost world and make it through a church experience? Until the church experience becomes something that helps everybody make it to the end. If the answer is yes, you're in good shape. If there's one thing that's wearing on most people when it comes to an absence of good, strong mental health, it's an absence of forgiveness. Jesus himself said, forgive us our debts, as he taught us how to pray, as we forgive our debtors. He went on to say in verse 13 of Matthew 6, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And he left this postscript on his ideal prayer. He said, for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you also. And there are people listening to me today who don't understand that the offer of forgiveness is conditional. But if you don't forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Yes, somebody's done you wrong. Welcome to the journey. <laughs> yes, it was maybe somebody who wasn't supposed to. Welcome to the journey. 
It was a parent. Welcome to the, it was a pat. Welcome. It was a teacher. It was an elder. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And given time, somebody will have the opportunity to give to you what you need to give to them right now. Jesus will go on to say in Matthew 18, after he tells us how to solve our problems, he'll say, if you don't forgive somebody from the heart, so you were abused. Forgiveness doesn't mean you run back to the relationship just like it was. No, but it does mean you release, release those people from their very imperfect behaviors, which left a long, imperfect mar on you. Jesus has the ability to heal. Somebody should have said amen. And there are plenty of people sitting in this congregation today who have felt and are feeling and are experiencing that healing power, praise God. Your origin, your family of origin, whatever deficits you might have brought from it, even whatever strengths, those are things that can only get better as you give Jesus permission to be the leader. But I want to assure you of one thing. The forgiveness you failed to give is the forgiveness you failed to get. It's serious with God. That's why he said, Peter, you don't get it. It's not seven times. It's 490 times 365 days out of the year because that's how long I've lingered with this nation. Ad infinitum. I'm here to tell you, we owe debts we don't understand. We're enemies from the beginning. The gift that's been given to us is undeserved. Like the old hymn says, Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the throne of God. He to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. I want to see you walking towards the buzz saw, and there's no way to get off the conveyor belt. And I want to see dear Jesus racing for you and grabbing you by the scruff of the neck and in the process being chewed up and spit out himself. There's nobody listening to me here today. You shouldn't be ashamed of Jesus. You shouldn't be ashamed of the gospel. The only thing the gospel does is tell you that you need to experience renewal and you can experience it only through one person, Jesus Christ. Turn over to Genesis chapter 4. Mental health. There are a lot of people today who are questing for assurance. It's the great cry of the evangelical church. And we've watched churches bend over backwards and say, I'm okay, you're okay. When the gospel says nothing of the sort. What the Bible says is, I'm loved and you're loved, but there is a problem. Genesis chapter 4. First family, first children. It says in verse 3, so it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord and the fruit of the ground. This was supposed to be a sin offering. It's substitutionary. There's no watermelon or apple. There's no orange or grapefruit that can do what shedding the life of an innocent lamb would do to the one shedding it and to the storyline of what it would cost for it to become reality, not just symbol. Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Fire didn't come down. So Cain became very angry and his countenance fell. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? Now listen, why would God ask that question if Cain didn't already know the answer? This isn't rocket science. If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? Some of your Bibles say, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desires for you, but you must master it, which means you can. If there's one thing that will destroy your mental health, no matter how many preachers stand up and preach grace ad infinitum, there is a grace that gives you the power to do what God asks you to do. And you can ask for the messaging on and on. But when you don't give the Holy Spirit the power to speak truth and then the power to enable the living of the truth, in other words, when you disobey, you're warring against your own mental health. There's such a thing called guilt. You can't rid yourself of it because you rid yourself of the preachers and the parents. When you're supposed to do something and you don't do it, You've got to deal with God. And however many spokespeople for God tell you you don't have to deal with God, they're all liars. 
God's alive. He's speaking. Now, if you're in the habit of thinking you've got the only line to God and nobody else can tell you what to do, well, you're confused about how God works because God has always set up authorities and he has this authority and he speaks through people to keep us from becoming imbalanced. Last week, as I had a few minutes in the foyer, we had those, those two moments where one person said to me, what you said today is exactly what God's been saying to me. Yep, amplification, there it is. And remember the other person, someone whom I love very much, said to me, you were looking at me when you said, I said, I didn't even know you were in the room. This is a God moment when you have the chance for God to go around all the circles of your family systems. Unless, of course, you've got a strained relationship with the head of the, this local village family, uh, at least in a structural sort of way, and in a divinely appointed sort of way, that's at least this pastor this morning because I've been appointed as the senior pastor. You could have a problem with me. But barring that today, this is God's way of going around all those systems and saying, hey, that was me talking to you. Because this sermon was prepared with nobody in mind, which is what makes the divine application of it through the Holy Spirit divine. This is why coming to church matters, partially, by the way, because God has a hard time breaking into some family systems. Especially when they're rich and well-educated and dysfunctional to boot. Mental health is a function of doing what's right. To go against conscience, Martin Luther said, is neither safe nor prudent. Paul will even agree with it in the New Testament when he will tell people, even though he'll tell them that food offered to idols is nothing, he'll tell them, for the sake of a weak-minded person, do what's right. Because going against your conscience, even if it's a little twisted, is problematic. Now, I'm not here for protecting twisted versions of how salvation works. But I will tell you this. Whatever value system you have, until you understand its adjustment, if you don't live by it, you weaken yourself. We think about Nehemiah. Turn over to that book, Nehemiah chapter 4. Mental health. How do you get stronger? We're headed into the greatest mental health crisis, and the world's going to take note that we're not having one. And that's going to be one of the greatest witnesses there is. The last three years have been three very interesting years. Our society has been in emotional regression. Fear and security have been the driving dynamics. And what came about, which was so difficult in that circumstance, was that there was only one way to mitigate risk. Nehemiah chapter 4. There's a lot of disorder in Jerusalem. It's so disorderly, there's so much rubble that the enemies suggest that Nehemiah can't even get his job done. Getting rid of disorder strengthens your environment and strengthens your inner environment. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 9. It says, But we prayed to our God, and because of them we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus in Judah it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there's much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemies said, they, will know or they won't know or see until we come amongst them, kill them, and put a stop to the work. And when the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they'll come up from against every place where you may turn. I'm going to hit the pause button. There's nothing worse than being a victim for your mental health. And by the way, our society doesn't know how to forgive, which means we're only into retribution and repayment, which means there's going to be constant angst and stress, and things are never going to be worked out. And when you look at theories, when you look at societal theories, you ought to see whether or not there's any place in them for forgiveness. Because in societies which are multi-generational, there are oftentimes wrong actions in the past. Some of them weren't understood to be wrong when they were being transacted. But when a society doesn't understand forgiveness, it has serious angst issues. It cannot be healthy. This is where we're at. But being a victim is probably in the top three of how to destroy your mental health. Because once you become a victim, you are a functionary of circumstance and somebody else is going to have to make it better. The truth of the matter is, writing in the book Education, page 7, Ellen White tells us, 
that we are to teach our children to be masters of circumstance, not functionaries of circumstance. I'll tell you a few simple ways to do this. You feel like you're about to go under financially? Okay. Make sure you're returning your tithe. That's placing a little bit of order on disorder. It's taking control where there's enough control and a little bit of faith. You're living a life of stress? Straighten and clean up your house or your room. Bring some order out of disorder. That's part of what was going on with Nehemiah. But as soon as you act on your circumstances, you feel better. Now, let's do a little diagnosing of the last three years. Eventually, everybody was in a position, whether you feel good about it or not, where they, most everybody, succumbed to the wearing of a mask. Now, science has shown in many respects there's limited benefit to it, but it did allow people to feel like they were doing something. In that, it had tremendous value. The problem with the last three years is that not only was there not good leadership and there wasn't a plan laid down, the only plan laid down for mitigation was really a few simple things. One was get a vaccination, which I'm not against, and everybody should follow their conscience. Another was stay away from people. But what about all those amazing mitigations that boost the health system and are a part of our journey? Somebody needs help. (laughs) So what we have going on is we have a chapter in American history where we have a victim mentality corporately across our society, and the only thing that could be done went against the conscience of some people in the doing of it. And we created this amazing rift in our society. Now, for Seventh-day Adventists who have some intimation that the things that John Harvey Kellogg learned up in Battle Creek 180 years ago, things like hydrotherapy, and then you add to it some of the research that came from our own health system farther down the way, nutraceuticals, mitigating all of those things to a position of unacceptability robbed many people of the ability to take and act on their circumstances and be in charge of what's going on as they face a serious disease as opposed to being a functionary of it. The Seventh-day Adventist church missed a divine opportunity to go from having slid to the tail to being the head and saying, you know, there's a lot of things you can do in this circumstance. Yes, on one end, go ahead if you feel comfortable and receive the vaccination. But on the other hand, if you don't want to do that, here's six other things you could do. And we should have been showing the world how to become masters of circumstance, not functionaries of science so-called. Nehemiah knew these people were afraid. The nobles of the Jews were saying, they're going to get you. Ten times they said, they're going to get you. They're going to sneak up on you. They're going to get you. You won't even know they came. Ultimate victim mentality. But look what happens. Leadership steps in. Verse 13. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and, I, and the exposed places, and I stationed the people with families and their swords, spears, and bows. When I saw their faces, I rose and I spoke to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, and I said, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your houses. When our enemies heard this, they decided they didn't want to fight anymore. He said, you know what a sword is? Put it in your hand. You know how to use it? Don't just bring the trowel to work tomorrow. Stand there with your spear. Somebody needs to be watching. Somebody needs to be holding the trumpet. When you hear me blow the trumpet, rally to me. Leadership should not make us more afraid. Leadership should make us less afraid. Which means you're going to have to face the risk that are an inherent part of life on planet Earth. Diseases come and diseases go, and more are going to come and go. The truth be told is that as soon as you can become a master of your circumstance with a plan and an action, you can do something. Proverbs twenty two thirteen, The lazy man says, there's a lion outside. I'll be slain in the streets. There is nothing that is more incompatible with mental health and strength 
than self-centered, self-serving laziness. You want your kids to be able to stand up? Put a dish rag in their hands and a vacuum cleaner. Show them what a toilet brush is. Show them where the trash can is. Make sure they clean the litter box. These are the things that actually give a person a little sense that they have an obligatory role to play in society, starting with your home. There's no free lunch. If love for somebody else is the great cornerstone of courage, then teaching practical love by banishing laziness from our heart and from the hearts of others. I was on my way home Thursday night. I'd had a full day at work. And my wife and I had gone to do our grocery shopping, which is our habit. As I was driving down Pokagon Road, I saw something in the road. I said, it's either a bird or it's a trash bag. It's late. I don't want to mess with it. I turned my car around at Smith Road. I go back down into the valley. And sitting on the road is what I now know is this very beautiful barred owl. It's sitting upright, but it doesn't fly when I walk up to it. I am not a veterinarian, but I knew the next car down this road was going to kill this bird. I had just purchased some painting drop cloths, and I went and got one out, and I tried to grab the bird. Well, barred owls are not amenable to human beings holding on to them. (laughs) And in her limited ability to get away, One of those very sharp talons went into my finger. I got her to the side of the road and I thought I could just leave her there. And it's like, no, you can't just leave her there. I took her home. I got an old dog cage. I mean, I wanted to go home and relax. My niece, who knows a lot about birds... And my daughter were conversing and said, a heat lamp, that would be good for her. So I don't know if that bird wants a heat lamp or not, but I don't want my garage burning down. Short story, good ending. Went out and checked on the bird. My, wife, my daughter went out and checked. It was, you could see it slowly breathing. It was very sad. Through the night, I'm praying, Lord, either heal the bird or let it die. It was inconvenient for my niece to drive the heat lamp over. And she volunteered to take the bird in the morning if it was still alive. It was. It's a beautiful female barred owl with a broken foot that's being rehabilitated. <laughs> Will probably never be in the wild again, maybe in the zoo, but like my son said, well, he's still, she's still alive. How many inconvenient moments come to our lives where we have to decide that love over selfishness needs to be the modus operandi? It could be listening a little longer to a coworker. It could be missing a meal because there's a project that just came up for some volunteer organization. It might even be a thing like a church. Or somebody might need a little bit of your money. Love and service are cornerstones of strong mental health. And by the way, good marriages as well as good work relationships are built on the very same cornerstones of character that all of this mental health subject matter is as well. Yeah, there's a line in the streets. I'm going to die. You are. The righteous say, there's a line in the streets. Somebody needs to go out and deal with it. Every person must face the practical realities of life, its opportunities, its responsibilities, its defeats, and its successes. How do, he is to meet these experiences, whether he's to become a master of victim or circumstances. Master or victim of circumstances depends largely upon his preparation to cope with, his edu- cope with them in his education. Did Saul have a mental health crisis? I'm talking about the one who pursued David. Yes. What drove it away? Think about it. Music. 
the right kind of music. Now, if the right kind of music has spiritual power, tell me what the wrong kind of music has. You want to be mentally strong? Go home and sing the hymns. You don't like singing the hymns? It's because you've gotten used to singing something else. Of course, most of the rest you listen to, you don't sing. You just listen to. And by the way, the enemy of your souls knows that you want somebody to identify with you in your sinfulness. So he'll pluck all the cords of sympathy for how you're feeling without giving you a solution. You want power of mind? You need spiritual power. How could Paul go through all of that? His mental power was directly tied to his spiritual power. David was depressed and guilty. Why? Because he never confessed what he did that was wrong. Finally, if you read Psalm 32, he did. Elijah had wrong expectations. He had lived for three and a half years as a fugitive. Finally, after the destruction of the, of the false prophets, he says to himself, game over. Nobody can deny the scoreboard. 450 or 850, whether it was all of them or only part of them, dead, one prophet of God still alive. Score, one to 450. Only the 450 that are gone are gone. They're off the field. There's only one left alive. He goes to sleep in the gates of Samaria, and he's shaken awake by somebody saying, game's not over, quarter four is up, and she says, you're just like them by tomorrow. When your expectations are wrong, it affects your mental health, which is another reason to be out circulating outside of your family of origin. We get the collective best from everybody. God was very good to Elijah. Two meals, divine strength to go 40 days the wrong way. Very tender God until he got down to Mount Sinai and he was hiding in a cave on the holy mountain. And God said to him, what are you doing here on the unholy mountain? Or on the holy mountain with an unholy heart. Oh, he starts through his spiel. God says, I don't really want to listen to that. Go stand out on the mountain. It shakes, it burns, and it howls. And then he starts through his spiel again. God says, no, it isn't time. Expression deepens impression. God says, go back. There's this tender side of God that gives him the energy to go 40 days in the wrong direction, and there's this tough side of God that says, you know what, I've cared about you now. Now I'm going to push you to go back and do what you shouldn't have run away from. Job, disoriented, can't put it together. The demoniacs can't even talk for themselves. And finally, I want to leave you with this note, perhaps one of the most precious and touching of all stories. A very articulate man who sticks his foot in his mouth too many times on the night before Jesus dies won't give up his ambition to sit on the Messiah throne. And Jesus says, you're going to have to give it up. And what we're going to go through is going to make you give it up. Peter says, even if what you say is right and everybody else runs away from you, it won't be me. Proud, selfish, dishonest, all traded in on self-loathing. Judas, the betrayer, and Peter, the denier, aren't that different. They both had ambitions. They didn't want to surrender to the messiahship of the God in the universe. One throws his 30 pieces of silver down on the stones of the temple precinct and says, I betrayed innocent blood. Finds a rope and walks to a cliff and ends it all. The other may run right by the hanging body of this man. We don't know, but we know he crosses the Kidron Valley and he goes up the Mount of Olives and falls down right where Jesus had been on the ground himself. And there's these words going through his head. Simon, Simon, I've prayed for you. Can't get that look of Jesus out of his eyes. You want something to ruin your mental health? Just be too proud to admit the obvious. Be too proud to hear somebody who loves you enough to wound the relationship tell you something you don't want to hear and ignore them. But most of those people who love you enough to talk to you 
prayed before they did, whispered a prayer just before they said something, and will go away disappointed but prayerful. Here's what the Bible says, <laughs> that Jesus is a mediator of a better temple and a better covenant and that he ever lives to make intercession for you. He knows how to deal with the insecure and the proud. And his message to us all is the same. If you won't listen to me now, when you stumble and you find out you're human and you're not in charge, may this thought come to your mind. I'm praying for you. You can come to me. It's hard. It's hard for us collectively as a church. It's hard for a church to say, I made mistakes. I personally think the spiritual and mental health, which is exhibited in the administrative and leadership or lack thereof actions of any congregation over the last four or five decades, basically says we focused on ourselves. We've protected our kingdoms and our fiefdoms. We have not extended ourselves for the poor or taken risks for the lost. Jesus has been praying for us. I'm here to tell you we're coming up to a point in time. The only white says don't argue about how the 144,000 are. I choose to believe that since all the numbers that are used to multiply them are, well, there is no 12,000. 12 times 12,000. While there were 12 literal disciples and there were 12 literal sons of Jacob, the 12,000 mark kind of starts saying this is a multiplier effect. But I want to tell you whether there's 144 literal people, 44,000 literal people alive at the end of time or not, I don't know. But I do know this only eight people got on the boat. And I know the sum total of staying close to God is enough mental, emotional, spiritual health to say, <laughs> as for me and my house, this is who I am. This is what I'll be. All the pressures all around us. <laughs> it's the current health crisis of our day. But I'm here to tell you, you are loved. It doesn't matter where you started from. It doesn't matter how dysfunctional your family is. It doesn't matter how abused or beat up you were. There's help and therapy. And I encourage anybody that needs it to please don't consider it any worse than going to see a doctor for a for another illness. But for all of us that are well enough to be here today and listen to this sermon, we're going to go from conquering to more conquering. And they that wait upon the Lord renew their what? Read your Bible. Sing the songs. Talk to God. And just one last little thing before I step away. When you keep nothing between you and Jesus... When you keep nothing between you and your spouse, I cannot tell you how much mental, emotional strength that gives you. It's the practical working out. That's why elders are to be chosen who figured it out at home. May God help us in this new year. Yep, God's going to lead you up to something. I'm pretty convinced with the way this property worked out, there's a big challenge coming to us. God said, step aside, you listened, I'm going to show you how much I'm in this. Unanimous, anonymous vote, unheard of in a business session, and tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars will come to you very quickly. I'm going to show you, you are to do this. And somewhere along the way, <laughs> I'm going to show you an obstacle. And when I do, you get to act like either the Israelites that came out of Egypt or you get to act like the next generation that went into the promised land. Which will it be? Friends, you're loved. That should be the source. Pass it on. Share it. Affirm. Love. Encourage. Edify. And when necessary, exhort. But I want you to know something. No matter where you're at today, you can be even better tomorrow. Praise God. Let's go forward into this new year. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn.